On 30th of June, 2016, Rodrigo Duterte is elected the new president of the Philippines. He vows to wage war on drugs and drug dealers. Hitler massacred three million Jews. There is three million drug addicts. I'd be happy to slaughter them. By January 2017, Duterte's war had killed more than 7,000 people. It has been called the deadliest drug war of all time and has provoked international outrage. So that's the problem with extrajudicial killings. You don't have any opportunity to ascertain whether the target is the right target. Undercover Asia goes behind the scenes of Duterte's war on drugs and reveals the impact of his campaign in the impoverished slums of Manila. Mabilis naman talaga ang market ngayon kasi nga walang mabilan eh. Wala nang, wala silang mabilang iba. Oh, bet ka gagay niya. Pagano pa, ano ko pa ba, barlido po eh. Will this lethal war on drugs solve the problems of the Philippines or deepen the plight of the nation's poorest? I am ready to start my work for the nation. As he campaigned to win the presidency, Rodrigo Duterte pledged to eliminate what he called the drug menace. Many of his supporters fervently agreed, and as soon as he won power, he declared war on drugs. At the sharp end of his campaign, the Philippine National Police. <laughs> Marikina City Police Chief Lorenzo Hollanday peps up his team for the day's work. Hollanday's strategy focuses on the poorest areas of Metro Manila, where poverty levels are among the worst in Asia. In the city's villages, known as barangays, a drug known as shabu or methamphetamine has taken a grip on many. We have uh, about 600 uh, personnel, uniform personnel here in Marikina, which covers um, 16 barangays or villages. We have about uh, 400 to uh, 500,000 population. All of these barangays are affected by drugs. Uh, one of my uh, brother-in-law was shot by uh, a group of uh, drug pushers. So we deem it necessary, it's about time that we should uh, remove this menace in our society. The target for Hollanday's anti-drug squad today is a low-income barangay called Tumana. Many people here are low-paid seasonal workers desperately looking for jobs. This village is 181 hectares. Definitely 45,000 individuals living here. 45,000 individuals is a big problem. Actually, they call this barangay village a house of many drug pushers and users. Ito yung list. Ito yung isa to. Ito dapat mawala na to kasi dahil masyado siyang pusher. 
Duterte's war assigns a key role to these village captains, like Zifrit. He is required to compile lists of suspected drug dealers and addicts with their addresses. When the new president assumed this office, there was a mandated law that all the village captain in the Philippines, primarily here in Marikina and in my barangay or village, must do some actions on what to do to, for those people who are into drug addictions or into bad vices. Today, Police Chief Hollanday takes personal charge of Operation Tokang, which means to knock and plead. The police units, accompanied by Captain Zifrid, will target individuals on the watch list, offering the suspects a chance to surrender for rehabilitation. But even the village captain admits that there is uncertainty about whether everyone on the list is really involved with drugs. In listing the affected people, we asked the community leaders in that area. We called them, we made a meetings, a series of consultations. Of course, there's a fear for us, might be the, the wrong information might get with some people. The officers pressure Raymond to surrender. They make it clear that if he does not cooperate, he may face retribution. So yung sa kabila ng pagbisita namin dito, ibabaliwalain mo yung sinasabi namin. Salamat mo na rin. So ngayon kami, kaya kami nandito, kinakatok namin kayo para bigyan kayo ng pagkakataon. The war on drugs puts the police under pressure too. Duterte often makes inflammatory speeches demanding the liquidation of three million drug addicts. Most experts believe the figure is exaggerated, but on the streets, the police must deliver by persuading suspects to surrender. But in the barangays, many fear that the notorious lists are in reality kill lists, and many are reluctant to turn themselves over. <laughs> Suspects have reason to be fearful. Even the village captain admits that police operations can end in lethal shootings. The other day, there, there was a people who was, was killed. It, it was gunshot by the Philippine National Police. Then, actually, he was being accused as a pusher here in the community. They might think that the users or the pusher might be killed instantly whenever they knock, the, knock in their houses. Marlon eventually agrees to surrender, but he remains anxious about his fate. Ay, hindi po nawawala po yun, ma'am, kasi sa napapanood ko po sa TV, hindi, hindi po talaga na ano, yung mga sumusoko na nga, talagang pinapatay, ay pinapatay pa rin. Like many drug users on the police list, Malon admits that drugs like shabu are a way of coping with poverty. Uh, 
wala na silang ano. Ako hindi. Isang buwan. Dalang base lang. Dalang base. Wala naman kayong pambili. Ano, wala naman pambili. Basuran nga lang nagtatrabaho eh. Ay, wala. Ano lang. Papasabay lang kami 50 pesos. Papasabay lang din lang mo. The link between drug use and poverty is acknowledged, even by the nation's drug enforcement agency. It's ironic to, to think that many, many of those who are using dangerous drugs belong to the low or unemployment, uh, low income or unemployed uh, class. And so uh, you would imagine that if only to sustain their vice, they would actually be involved in the illegal drug activities as well. Since Duterte declared war on drugs, more than 70,000 alleged pushers have surrendered. But it seems that many drug dealers are finding new ways to beat the system. Kung tutusin, mabilis naman talaga ang market ngayon kasi nga walang mabilan ni. Wala nang wala silang mabilang iba. Stop until the last drug lord, the last financer, and the last pusher have surrendered or put behind bars. On the front line of President Duterte's war on drugs in the Philippines, Chief of Police Lorenzo Hollande is ramping up Operation Tokang. <laughs> Instead of going house to house, trying to persuade alleged users to surrender, today's target is a well-known pusher. Subject natin, itong si, kan, si Prince Dipano, alias Jepoy. Uh, pusher to sa area ng Tanyong. Dapat may, kan, may bentahan. Familiarize yourselves with the, kan, itong taong ito. Okay? Bata pa ito. About, uh, may kulay ng buhok. About 23 years old. Baba lang, mga 5'3". The police need to catch the pusher red-handed to make an arrest. So an undercover police officer is sent in to set up a deal. The officer is taking a huge risk. Pagpunta po doon sa area, doon po susubukan bibili ng shabu at kung makakabili po sa kung makakabili po yung operative natin at yung informant natin eh doon po magkakaroon ng ano ng pagkaaresto sa suspect. But today, the pusher doesn't take the bait. Nagintay kami ng mga hanggang nga lang isang oras kung nasaan itong suspect na to. At hinanap siya kung saan siya naroon, pero hindi na siya makita kung saan, sa lugar na yon sa barangay Tanyong. It's a setback. But every day, the police campaign fills local jails with suspects. Nearly 50 prisoners are currently crammed in police cells meant for 18. These men all refuse to surrender for rehabilitation. Now they must wait for trial. It's safer here yes. than outside. We sleep, uh, most of us are uh, uh, sitting, standing. We sleep close our eyes. Well, we didn't surrender because uh, the, the, the new administration, they, 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 they tend to kill anybody who is you know, using drugs. They don't give us any you know, um, transformation to, you know, to change uh, radi not, uh, gradually, you know. That's why we're telling you, there's no human rights. There's always human left. But no, no, no lives left, right? Duterte's government claims that the campaign has led to the arrest of tens of thousands of drug dealers. The evidence, they say, is the rise in street prices of shabu, or methamphetamine, the most commonly used drug. After the assumption of the new administration, the price ceiling 
has in fact increased. The, well, the basic price remains to be at 1,200 pesos. Now, drug traders on the street uh, sell as high as 25,000 pesos per gram. And from that alone, we will see that there is a significant, a very significant increase in the volume and value of dangerous drugs confiscated, which translates to the difficulty of trading of illegal drugs on the ground. The undercover Asia team persuaded one dealer to talk about the impact of Duterte's war on his business. He calls himself Shane. He admits that his profits have fallen and business is slower. Lade yung ano yung 50 grams kayang ipaubos ng isang araw. Pero ngayon, ibilang siguro ng mga tatlong linggo o kaya dalawang linggo bago mapaubos yun. May bibenta ko lang siya ngayon ng kung lahat-lahat susumain kasama yung small part na itinabi ko, mga apat na libo lang, so masyadong mababa yung ano. Mga 500 lang ang tutubuin. Kung tutusin, mabilis naman talaga ang market ngayon kasi nga walang mabilan eh. Wala, nang, wala silang mabilang iba. But Shane is not deterred. And the Philippines Drug Enforcement Agency admits that many dealers are successfully building up new networks to beat the police. They're getting more innovative to try and avoid arrest because if, let's say, I deal with person A for, for, uh, for the sale of, of uh, a sachet of methamphetamine, it's not, it's not going to be that same person who will be handing the illegal drug. Shane agrees to show Undercover Asia how a transaction is made. He has to be very careful in all his business dealings. See, it's a test. Hmm? Eh, magkano ako ito ngayon? Eh, mga mga, six yata. One, six. Pwede, baka pwede kahit mga alagang ano lang, mga alagang tatlong dito. Hindi, kulang yung dala kong pera. Ayun, ang dala kong pera, ang dala kong pera rito, tatlong libo lang. Hindi ko naman expected kasing ganun kataas ngayon. Teka lang. Teka lang na ako. In Duterte's new order, the drug business is high risk. But dealers like Shane claim that he and many other dealers have no alternative. Katulad na lang sa lugar namin, syempre slum area. Pag sinabi mo slum area, ang mga tao dyan, hindi nakapagtapos ng pag-aaral. Yung iba dating ex-convict. Kaya hindi sila ganun kadaling makakakuha ng trabaho. O kung makakakuha man ng trabaho, hindi sapat yung ano yung kinikita nila para dun sa means of living, lalo na dito sa Manila. By 18, terinay ko mag-drugs. Nagkatrabaho ko nung sa isang club bilang parang waiter. Eh, syempre, ang gabi yun eh. Yun, dun ako nag-try. By 2008, yun, nag-start ako magtinda. So, yun, trinay ko naman. But actually, parang tingin ko nga, magaling ako sa ganun. Parang, para kasi sa akin, it's all business eh. Kung hindi ko gagawin, may ibang gagawa. But the president shows no mercy. Kano mabas ko yung p***, ayun papatayan ko kayo. Magmakita o kaysa naman. And it's not only the police that Shane has to be concerned about. Since Duterte took office, there has been an explosion of killings carried out by vigilantes. It is believed that in Manila alone, there have been 150 extrajudicial killings during the president's first 100 days. So now, it's so bad. It's so bad. Mula nung nagpukasi yung presidente natin ngayon, sobrang nakakatakot na kasi 
Oh, sabihin na natin, basta sa balita, lumalabas. Ayaw niya ng extrajudicial killings. Pero yung mga tao sa ilalim niya, hindi naman kasi ganyan na nangyayari, lalo na sa lugar namin. Sobrang iba. Merong mga, kaki, meron akong mga kakilala na namatay. Mga kasamaan ko rin dati. Namatay nang wala naman talagang sabi lumaban. Hindi naman talaga eh. Today, murders carried out by gangs of vigilantes are commonplace occurrences on the streets of Manila. Pagkama lang kasi ang tanong nung bumarel, ikaw na ba? Ikaw na ba? Sabi ro, ganun. Maraming nakarinig. Ikaw na ba? Ikaw na ba? So that's the problem with extrajudicial killings. You don't have any opportunity to ascertain whether the target is the right target. Since Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte declared a war without mercy on the nation's drug dealers, police operations have led to the deaths of some 3,000 Filipinos. But an almost equal number have died at the hands of vigilantes, and the majority of these slayings remain unexplained. The President is unapologetic. I know that there are those who do not approve of my methods of fighting criminality. Sale and use of illegal drugs and corruption. They say that my methods are unorthodox and verge on the illegal. International protest has been loud, but the killings continue unabated. Friday night, 8 p.m. There has been a fatal shooting in the neighborhood of Buleka in Marikina City. Police Chief Hollanday and his team arrive on the crime scene. There was a call uh, at the police station. That's why we came here. And we saw this uh, guy sprawled on the floor the, uh, on the, uh, along the road with uh, several uh, wounds from a uh, bullet. According to the witnesses, there are about uh, five to six uh, gunmen who are responsible for this. And uh, they're all wearing uh, jackets with helmet. You know? The victim is 41-year-old Romulo Andres, an unemployed tricycle driver. He was shot just meters away from his mother's shop. It is significant that Andres's name was on the police watch list. Meron siyang isang tama sa mukha. Yung tago sa may ulo. Dito, tsaka rito sa leeg, isang ganun lang. Yung maraming tama, baraso, tsaka yung katawan. Ang sabi niya sa akin, nanay, yang titigil na akong magbisyo kasi tatakot na ako kay President Duterte, baka, baka barilin ako. Nagkatotoo naman yung sinabi niya na yun. Talagang babago na ako sabi niya gano'n kasi may anak pa akong lima. Eh, gusto ko magpag-aral yung mga bata, sabi niya gano'n. Pagkama lang kasi ang tanong nung bumarel, ikaw na ba? Ikaw na ba? Sabi ro gano'n. Maraming nakarinig. Ikaw na ba? Ikaw na ba? Hindi pa sila sure na yun ang babarilin nila. Tinira na ng ano. Vigilante killings like this are a daily occurrence in the Philippines. Every month during the first six months of Duterte's term, gangs killed 1,000 people. Many had been on the police lists of suspects. These brutal extrajudicial assassinations sparked protests by human rights groups. The Philippine Commission of Human Rights, which is independent of the government, 
has launched a nationwide investigation to help families seek justice. We believe that a drug problem can actually be eliminated without putting into risk the lives of uh, the potential violators and adhering to the rule of law. The numbers are adding up every day. Again, there is difficulty in trying to cope up with the number of extrajudicial killings. And also, because of the culture of fear that is now pervading the Philippine society, we have difficulty in getting leads in our investigation. In Duterte's Philippines, vigilantes target not only alleged drug dealers, but even the people who combat the drug trade. The family of 42-year-old Proli Bolo gather at his grave. He was a victim of a vigilante shooting, and his family are struggling to come to terms with the tragedy that befell them on 7th of September, 2016. Proli Bolo was a trader in junk and a village captain in Calucan City, Metro Manila. He was an active campaigner against the local drug trade. After work that afternoon, Bolo has drinks with friends. Undercover Asia has found chilling CCTV footage that reveals what happens next. From one camera, Four men can be seen traveling towards Bolo's junk shop. On a second, we see them enter. Bolo's wife was working nearby. May narinig akong putok, mga anim. Kasi doon ako sa may CR, narinig kong putok anim. Sabay takbo ko papunta doon sa pwesto nila. Tapos nagsisigaw na ako doon sa mga kasama niyang dalhin sa ospital, dalhin sa ospital, baka, baka mabuhay pa ako. Wala na talaga, wala na. The CCTV footage shows the vigilante gang escaping. Despite the fact that the assassination was recorded on CCTV, the killers have never been identified. The dubious circumstances of Bolo's death led the Commission of Human Rights to take up the family's case. He was actually uh, supportive of the drug campaign and has actually uh, forwarded a list to the Philippine National Police with regards to those personalities who were involved in his barangay or in his community uh, with regards to the drug trade. It raises question, why was he a victim of uh, this uh, drug campaign? Who may have perpetrated the killing? And what could have been the possible motive for his killing? As a village captain, Bolo was obliged to compile lists of suspects for the police. His wife is convinced it was this obligation that led to his death. Kung time na to ni Presidente Duterte, talagang pinagbawala na po talaga sila dahil papatayin talaga niya kayo pag nalaman na nagbibinta kayo. Kaya pinasusuko niya rin. Marami siyang pinasuko. Sinabihan ko rin siya nung time na yon na uh, kahit siya ramdam niya rin sa sarili niya na once na magbigay siya ng ano, ang hindi niya na alam kung sino ang kalaban niya, yung it, 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 inilista niya o yung, uh, o yung mga polis. Kaya sabi ko, delikado yan. Proli Bolo, who worked so hard to weaken the grip of drugs on his community, was another victim of the war on drugs. Extrajudicial killings are not new to Duterte's style of government. 
When he served as mayor of Davao before becoming president, he was linked to an alleged death squad operating in the city, but he denied any involvement. And I was investigated during my mayorship days already. And there is the result. And also my lady, in all these years, not a single case was filed against me. It's all talk until now. Then in September 2016, a man called Edgar Matubato testified in front of a Senate committee in Manila. He claimed to have served in the Davao death squad and to have taken orders directly from Duterte himself. You have to ask him himself if that was accurate. Siguro ang napatay namin sa Davao, lahat-lahat, uh, siguro mga 1,000 mahigit siguro yung napatay namin doon. Gusto ko lang malaman ng mga tao na mahinto na yung mga patayan sa Davao City. President Duterte's war on drugs is unleashing a wave of killings across the Philippines that shows no sign of abating. His supporters claim that when he was mayor of Davao, his draconian measures transformed a conflict-torn city with high crime rates into one of the safest places in the Philippines. The fact that the president won, you know, it, it really shows the model that Davao has become as far as the rest of the country. Because it's uh, some kind of a safe zone that has uh, been established, at least in terms of uh, image. No? Because the mayor then, uh, who's now the president, no? made it a point that uh, Davao will be just the center for, uh, of, of uh, urbanization and development. No? And uh, you know, uh, any lawless activity is something that is uh, uh, really strictly uh, prohibited. This reputation came at a terrible human cost. During the period when Duterte was mayor of Davao, it is alleged that there were more than a thousand killings carried out by a death squad. There was no proof that this vigilante death squad really existed until Edgar Matabato testified in front of the Senate Justice Committee. He reveals shocking details of his involvement with the death squad and claims that orders to kill were given by the city mayor, Rodrigo Duterte. Nuha ako ng, ni Mayor Duterte. Nagawa siya ng grupo ng Lambada Boys kung liquidation squad. Hindi pa DDS noon. Ang umpisa namin, ang gusto niyang trabaho, ang pagpatay ng drug pusher, hold upper, ripis, snatcher. Yun ang trabaho. Yun ang trabaho ko. Akala ko makakatulong ako sa mga ma mabuting mga tao. Kaya siyempre, mga kriminal mga tao ang pinapatay namin. At saka nakukonsensya naman ako kung may pinapatay nga babae. Yung tinapo namin yung mga bata pa, yung tatlo, uh, mga... 18, 18, puro babae yan. Suspect lang ng drugs. Ang masakit naman sa akin, ma'am, parang nagkonsensya ako kay ginalaw pa ng mga pulis ng kasamahan ko yung mga bata. Tapos pinatay, sinaksak, tinapon na. Basta sa akin lang, Gusto kong masabi, matama, tulong ko sa sambayang Pilipino na totoong-totoo lang ang sinasabi ko. Siguro ang napatay namin sa Dabao, lahat-lahat, uh, siguro mga 1,000 mahigit siguro yung napatay namin doon. Gusto ko lang malaman ng mga tao na mahinto na yung mga patayan sa Dabao City. Kay lumantad ako, hindi ako nagpapabayad, hindi ako nag na. Kusa na ako, na ako. 
uh, dahil sa daming namamatay na, daming namamatay. Merong laud kuwari din. So dito sa... Matabato's high-risk appearance before the Senate Justice Committee to testify about his role in the Davao Death Squad was supported by Senator Antonio Trulanis, who has taken an open stand against the president's war on drugs. He testified that uh, President Duterte himself was behind the creation and operation of the Davao Death Squad. So we use that also as a uh, pattern of uh, operations with what's happening right now all over the country. So the next objective was now to establish the truth on who's behind the extrajudicial killings in the country. There were numerous reports of the systematic and widespread uh, operations, which led us to uh, speculate at, at least that uh, it is state-sponsored. And now, granting, without conceding, that he's actually telling the truth, that uh, he has nothing to do with the EJ case, the question is, what is he doing to stop it? If he really is a good leader, uh, as he claims uh, himself to be, then why can't he announce or direct his Philippine National Police to stop the EJ case once and for all? Just a month after Matabato's confession, the Senate Justice Committee, which is chaired by an ally of Duterte, rejected his claims and terminated the hearings. In the first place, insofar as the Davao Death Squad, there is no uh, finding yet that the Davao Death Squad exists. The Senate's decision puts an end to the investigation into the deaths of victims gunned down by suspected vigilantes since Duterte took power. When we started it, there were around 3,000 deaths already. And when they abruptly stopped it um, two months after, there were already 6,000 deaths. Senator Trulani's campaign to expose the extrajudicial killings is on hold for now. The president requested another six months to continue his campaign against drugs. But the support system needed to handle more than a million alleged drug users and dealers who have surrendered to the authorities is now stretched to its limits. Prisons like the Quezon City Jail overflow with the human harvest of Duterte's war. And outside the jails, the rehabilitation centers are at bursting point too, creating a treatment crisis for the country's 44 drug rehabilitation centers. In Marikina City alone, over 7,000 surrendered, but there is only one local government treatment center with a capacity for 50 patients. Since the president's campaign on the war on drugs, a lot of them are, you know, uh, fearful. A lot of families are fearful that drug does, the surrender is here, fearful. So they want to be um, rehabilitated at the same time. Our problem now is improving the aftercare program because we need to uh, interlink or connect with the barangay with that so that uh, within the community, they can follow them up. Uh, we need to train more people to handle the, the drug dependence because not everyone is up for that. We need to train a lot of people. Um, they serve for six months and then upon discharge with the aftercare program, there's a need of manpower in a sense of separate staff. With treatment centers at breaking point, in the poverty-blighted barangays of Metro Manila, it is down to dedicated individuals like Pastor Miguel to reach out to addicts, like 35-year-old Marlon. But faced with thousands needing treatment, Miguel is overwhelmed. In Marikina, there are only two doctors who could provide a medication regarding rehab, uh, this case about drug addiction. We need more to hire more doctors because Marikina has 16 barangays. 
So what can the doctors do for that? So he is not available always to a certain barangay. So we could move very quick because the ability of the doctor is there only to. The side of the doctors, they will introduce about natural, physical, but in my side, I will talk about spiritual. What they don't know, I know, and what they don't give, I could give. What is lacking for them, I will supply. In Duterte's Philippines, drug users like Marlon must rely on the power of prayer. Ang nagustong ko po talaga yung ano yung pinilangin niya ako na sana lum malayo rin ako talaga sa ganyan nga sa drugs na nga ganto tulungan niya ako hanggat makan din talaga ako makarecover sa bagay sa putikan na tangi niya ako niya talaga ako na sa ano lagang siya talaga ipapakilala niya ako sa panginoon daw talaga Unang piece lang po talaga, gawa ng... Sa kasi ng ano, kapitbahay namin dito, wala talaga, wala talaga. Para kung bagay sa ano, basura, bas basura lang kami rito, wala mo lang ano, mga pansin. Parang wala lang kayo, kumot wala naman kami talagang pera eh. Since his surrender to the police, Marlon's difficulties have deepened. He used to work as a scrap collector for a local recycling facility. But news that his name was on the police watch list reached his boss. He had no choice but to fire Marlon, despite his loyal service. Isi Marlon, eh, matagal ko ng tao nga as a ordinary sorter. So ngayon, nung naging leader ko na siya sa, sa isang grupo, uh, yeah, dere-derecho na siya. Nakikita ko naman maganda siyang leader. Now Marlon faces the daunting task of getting his name removed from the list. Kailangan niya palang makapag-submit pa ng mga proof na tag from barangay and then sa sa aming mga kapulisan na, na say clear ang pangalan niya na na involved lang siya o name withheld lang yung pagkakaano niya dun sa pangalan niya na nasama eh hangga't hindi niya naipapakita yun hindi mo na sa mga ano as Marlon waits for his name to be cleared, he is reduced to making rugs out of scraps to support his six children. Ay wala rin, wala pong naipon po, ma'am. Kasi kung pag, ano po ng pagbibilangin niyo po, ma'am, ang kinikita lang po namin sa isang araw lang po talaga, sandan. Alas buwan, lagi naman kami, ano rito? Wala naman kami sasabihin sa ganang buhay. Wala. More than a year since his election, President Duterte's war on drugs is still punishing the most impoverished communities of the Philippines. The campaign has allegedly sanctioned thousands of illegal killings by vigilantes. In the elections, many of the victims of these killings voted for Duterte. Ano naman ako sa programa ni Pangulo, kaya lang, yung nangyari nga sa anak ko, yun ang ayaw kong nangyari talaga. Napatay yung anak ko. The fact that he's killing fellow Filipinos should be a deal breaker. I'm confident that in time, once they realize that um, they elected a monster into office, then uh, they do the right thing. <laughs>